Hello everyone, I am Pastor Dave Karn, and welcome to Cross Keys Fellowship Online. We are glad you have chosen to tune in with us today. It's our prayer that you will worship with us and learn from God's Word. We believe the Bible is God's Word for us today. Its power molds and shapes us into the image of Christ while encouraging us and challenging us to go deeper in a relationship with Him. So join us now as we worship the Lord together. Um, so take your Bibles and turn to the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 5. <clears throat> uh, Galatians chapter 5, we're continuing to move through the book here. We're kind of coming to the end. And uh, Paul's going to talk a little bit about this idea of keeping in step. And so here we have this verse in chapter 5, verse 1. Look at it says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. And so Paul is, in these first few verses of chapter 5, kind of does, he kind of gives a personal final analysis to what he has been saying and what he has been talking about. And so the idea of being free or being set free is not that we can just, uh, we're, we're, can do whatever we want to do, is that we're set free from the bondage of sin, from the bondage of sin that we have in our lives, and we have now been set free. We have this ability now to do things that are absolutely, sometimes, in some cases, impossible to do, um, because it's not in our nature to really do them. And so Paul is teaching us and challenging us and teaching the believers here in Galatia in Galatia that they're not justified by works. The things that they do in life will never please God. The Bible tells us that faith is the only thing that pleases God. And so if we're in this um, way of life where we think that we can work our way to salvation, work our way to heaven, we fall short of what God has provided for us. And Paul teaches us this in these opening verses. He, he reminds us of what is going on and he gives us a warning. Notice what he says in verse 2. He says, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision... Christ will be of no advantage to you. In other words, he's saying this. If you're going to follow the law, if you're going to live by the law, Christ means absolutely nothing. Christ is no advantage. You, don't, you fall from grace, he says in verse 4. You're severed from Christ if you're justified by the law. And if you choose to live by the law, you're obligated to keep it all. You can't pick and choose what you want to do. And so Paul is really kind of showing the... Um, the, the limiting nature of the law. But we also had learned that the law teaches us and shows us that we're a sinner and ultimately points us to the solution to our sin, which is our Savior. And so we are set free from bondage. A great picture in the Old Testament is the Jewish people living in, in um, captivity, living in bondage for 400 years and God comes and, and sends Moses, and Moses delivers them out of that bondage. That's a picture of what happens in our lives when we come to faith in Christ. We are released from that bondage of sin. And so this is what Paul has been teaching and challenging us. He says in verse 9, sometimes in churches, and when false teaching exists in a church, it always leads to division. It always leads to you know, people latching on to certain things. And we could say that within the local church, we could say that within the church universal, is that when we latch on and we, we apply ourselves to some false teaching, it's going to pull us away. Verse 9 is very important to understand. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. It doesn't matter how much is going on in a church. It could be one person, one person saying one thing, one person taking a passage of Scripture and twisting it and, and getting people to think about it. That one little thing can, leaven, can destroy everything that's happening in the church. And so it seems to me in chapter 5 that there is some kind of um, implication to the church in general as a result of this false teaching. He says in um, verse 10, he says, I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. A false teacher will always bear that penalty. God will punish them for what they are doing. Proverbs tells us that there are seven things that God hates. They're abominations of God in Proverbs chapter 6. And one of those abominations is sowing discord among brothers. 
You know, we sometimes think it's like the worst sins, murder and rape and, and incest and all those kinds of things. And those things are bad, don't get me wrong. But very often do we skip over this idea of sowing discord. God hates that as much as he hates all the other stuff, right? And so we, we have to remember uh, our role now as a body of believers, our role as the church. What does that look like as we go out into the world? And so here Paul has been teaching us this, okay? And so now we kind of get to a question. We are set free through faith in Christ. Now what? What does that mean? What does that look like now? Or, you know, we could actually say, so what, right? And so if we're set free from Christ, if we're set free through faith in Christ, we're no longer a slave than slave, now how do we live? What does that look like now in, we, in the way we live our lives? And this is the question that Paul is ultimately going to answer in this final section. We said before that chapters 1 and 2 are kind of his, <clears throat> Paul developing his authority, his authenticity to share the gospel, to refute the false teaching that's going on. Chapter 2 and 3 is the theology of the, of the truth that is related to, uh, that contrary, contradicts the uh, false teaching. And then now chapter 5 and 6 is like, okay, now here's how you live it. Here's what it looks like. Here's what it looks like lived out. Because the Christian life isn't a matter of just praying a magic prayer and ultimately getting saved and then whatever we're going to do. Because at the end of the day, we can, get, we can ask God for forgiveness, and he'll save us, and he'll forgive us of our sin. Well, Paul has something very different to say about that, okay? Now, the challenge here is, once we get saved, that we shouldn't fall back into this yoke of slavery. That's what he says. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. So sometimes this is the way it happens. We get saved, we become a believer, and then everybody puts the law back on us. You can't do this, you can't say this, you can't go there, you can't have long hair, you can't have tattoos, you can't, we can't, automatically, we, all of what we do is we say, no, you don't need to follow the law, but then you get saved and you say, here's the law you need to follow. Okay, And that is, that is not true. That is not correct. As a believer now, we, know, we need to learn, okay, now I'm a, I have faith in Christ. I'm free from sin. Now how do I live? What does it actually look like? How does it, how does it work? Well, let me just tell you this one thing. You cannot, I cannot live the life that God wants me to live devoid of the Spirit of God. Can't happen. It cannot work. You cannot live a life that ultimately pleases God on the other side of salvation without recognizing and without identifying the work of the Spirit of God. The gospel is very um, rich with the Trinity. The Trinity is absolutely involved in our salvation. God chooses. Jesus died on the cross. The Holy Spirit seals us. They're all involved in this. It's not just Jesus dying on the cross. Okay, It's the Spirit of God that will now help you to live this way, to live the way that God wants you to live, to be involved with his word, be involved in the family, to be involved in, and connected and serving in so many different ways. And so now here Paul is going to answer this question. This week and next week we're going to try to answer this question. Now, what does it look like? How does it, how does it resonate in my life? What does God want me to do? Well, the first thing Paul was going to say is he's, he's going to say this. Do not abuse your freedom, but serve others through love. It's very interesting what Paul says here, okay? He says in verse 13, notice, For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Now, this is Paul saying, look, you're free. Now, that doesn't mean you can do whatever you want to do. That doesn't mean you can treat everybody how you want to be treated. You, it's, this is, there's an obligation now. We're called to freedom. We have a relationship with God. God has saved us through, uh, from, from our sin through faith. And now he says, don't use that. Don't abuse that. That doesn't mean you can live however you want to live. That doesn't mean you can function however you want to function. But he says, but through love, serve one another. It's interesting how he brings this into play. Because now he immediately goes to this one another idea. Serve one another through love. 
through love. You know, a lot of times we sit here and say, well, God is love. That's true. God is love. But that doesn't mean that God overlooks stuff. Right? He doesn't overlook sin. He doesn't, he doesn't ignore sin. He's separate from sin. And so as we think about this in our, in our relationship with one another, the challenge that we have with each other is this concept of loving one another. Because we tend to love those who love us back. We tend to love those who are easy to love. But this kind of idea is to love those who drive you nuts. To love those who don't, you don't get along with. Right? And this is a challenge, right? Because the freedom that we have, the abuse of that freedom that we have is, well, if they're going to act like that or they're going to do that or they're going to say that, I don't want to be anywhere near them. Paul says to do the opposite. Paul says to challenge, that it challenges these believers to do the opposite, which seems to suggest from this idea is that there's some kind of rift happening. There's some kind of rift happening in the church. Okay? There's some kind of disagreement going on, and it's possible that these false teachers are now leading people astray, and some people are saying, yeah, that's true. And others are saying, no, that's not true. And what ends up happening is they're starting to hate one another. This happens in churches all over the place. And you know what? The sad thing about it in churches is it always seems to happen around a preference. I prefer hymns. I don't want choruses. We're all going to hell because we're singing, we're singing choruses and not hymns. We can't sing choruses because they're too repetitious. Well, take Psalm 136, which is a song, and tell me if that's repetitious. You go home and look at it, and you'll see what I'm talking about. But these are the things that we impose onto, onto, onto Christianity. And they're driven by a preference, not an absolute. And so that sometimes can be the culprit in churches. Now, today we live in a day where the music and uh, the music wars aren't as severe as they once were. Okay? And we remember those days. And we remember, you know, it was Satan himself who played the drums. Okay, and the more I think about it, he probably played the bass. Sorry, Tyler. <laughs> right? But, I mean, the, you know, that's the way we used to think. And if we had them in church, it was like, holy cow, there's Satan. You know, it's like, no, that's not the, that's not the case in point. The point is, is that the scriptures teach that all kinds of instruments can be used to glorify God. Right? But sometimes we use that freedom. We abuse that freedom. We impose certain things. And so here, this teaching is kind of infiltrating their relationship with one another. In verse 14, it says, For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love, the Lord your, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He says, But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. So there is this, there is this implication, this application that's now happening within the church. And what they're doing is they're fighting, they're infighting, and they're devouring one another. They're biting and devouring and eating, and, just, and they're consuming each other. This is, this is exactly what Satan wants. This is exactly how Satan operates. Because the authority on planet Earth today is the church. God is using the church to make an impact in the world. God is using us to be light in the world, to be salt and light in the world. And Satan is going to attack the church. He's going to attack the family. He's going to attack the believer because he knows that if he can do that, he will upset the plan of God. And that's what's happening here. And it's interesting here how Paul now circles back around to the law. And you'll notice what he says. He says the whole law is fulfilled in one word. Love your neighbor as yourself. In Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 to 40, Jesus having a conversation with a scribe. This is one, somebody who knew the law, who understood the law backwards and forwards. And he asked Jesus this question, which one of those laws is the most important? And Jesus responded, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. He says, on these two, all of the law hinge on this. 
And this is the driving force. This is what drives us. As a believer, as now we are enslaved from, we're freedom for, free from our sin, we're now anchored to Jesus, we're anchored to the Lord, now we have this responsibility for one another, to one another. We're to live in such a way. We're not to abuse our freedom. 1 John says it this way very clearly, and I want you to kind of just look at this quickly with me this morning. This is the message we heard from him and proclaimed to you. This is John saying to his audience, this is what we heard. This is what God told us. This is what Jesus taught us. He said that God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And now, typically, I want to stop here because I want you to see that phrase. If we have fellowship with one another... And sometimes we take that verse and we use that verse to relate to each other. Okay? I don't think that that's what John is talking about. He's saying, if we, he says, if Jesus, God doesn't have any darkness, if we lie and don't practice the truth, he says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with God, one another. Okay? We have this relationship with God, this fellowship with God. It's unhindered by sin because we're recognizing it. That's why he says in the next phrase, he says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. My friends, that verse, 1 John 1, 9, is not a salvation verse. This is not a salvation verse. This is a verse for you and I. We don't need to go to the priest We don't need to go to the temple. We don't need to offer a sacrifice. We don't need to do any of that because we have a relationship with God. In order for our fellowship with God to remain intact, we have to constantly be asking God and asking him for forgiveness, confessing our sin. You don't need to confess it to me. You don't need to confess it to the elders. You need to confess it to God because we can't do anything. The elders can't do anything. Only God can. Only God can forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So this fellowship that we have with God is hindered by sin. Now let me say this, okay? I want you to understand there's a difference between fellowship and relationship, okay? Once you have a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, you have a relationship that is secure, sound, locked in place, kept in heaven for you by Almighty God. Nothing can happen. But your fellowship with God will be hindered if you're walking in sin, if you're walking opposite of God, if you're walking down a path that is opposite of what God has for you. And this is that abusing your freedom. This is that idea of of just, I can do whatever I want to do because I'm a believer. That's not true. We need to be mindful of it. And see, this is where the Spirit of God begins to start working. Because the Spirit of God is not going to let you walk down the path too far. All right? If you're feeling uncomfortable, there is no such thing as your conscience speaking to you. Okay? If you're a believer in Jesus and your conscience is speaking to you, that's the Holy Spirit saying, knock it off. It's not because you automatically woke up and recognized that you have a conscience. It's that your conscience is now being seared because you are walking opposite of what God has for you, and he's going to challenge you. He's going to teach you. And so this is the idea. This is what he's trying to say. And one of the ways we can offset that is by how we love one another, how we serve one another, how we come alongside one another. If we don't do that, then we're going to be biting and devouring each other, and eventually we're going to consume, up, consume each other. It sounds weird, when you think about it, but that's really the result. That's really what happens if churches are constantly fighting and arguing. I had a professor once who was a pastor, and he was teaching us one time in class, and he said, if, you're, if you ever go to a new church, and you ever take, he, took the, he did this, he said, I, when I started in this church, I asked for all the minutes from the business meeting. Business meetings can be very revealing, Okay? And it kind of gets, as a pastor, it kind of gets you down into the nitty-gritty. And he said he was reading through these. Eventually, he got to one, one month where it was just 
this person was fighting this person, and the next thing, the cops were called, and there was a fight going on, and it's like, that's absolutely ridiculous. And you know what? Absolutely immature. If the cops are called to a church business meeting, there's something really wrong with the church. And if I ever read that, I would run away from that church, but I don't know why he went, but he went. So, I mean, it's just, you know, you hear these things, you read these things, but this, this is what happens, right? Because we're so, like, inundated with preference instead of anchoring ourselves in the truth of God's word, in the truth of what God says. And we need to be mindful of that. So we can't abuse our freedom. But the way we kind of contrast that is by, by serving one another, coming alongside one another with a loving attitude, a loving spirit, recognizing their worth and their value and their necessary um, involvement in the church. And this is what Paul is saying. But then Paul goes this. He says, now, don't abuse your freedom, but now understand there's an opposition between the flesh and the spirit, okay? So now you, you live your whole life by the flesh. You were born with the flesh. That's your nature. That's your natural self. That's your natural person. You're born into this world a sinner. You don't become a sinner. You don't become a sinner when you first sin, because when was that? You have no idea. I mean, if you were six months old and you were screaming for a bottle, is that sin? And do you remember that? I mean, come on. So, you know, a lot of times we don't, we are born this way. We are born in need of a sinner. And so we have this flesh, but we don't have the spirit of God. And we don't get the spirit of God until we come to faith in Jesus. That's when the spirit of God comes upon us. That's when we're placed into the body of Christ. That's when we now have this power. Because you remember, as the disciples minister with Jesus, they don't have the spirit of God because they have Jesus walking with them. And Jesus says, this is why I got to go. I got to leave so that the spirit could come and carry their ministry. And their ministry does not become powerful until Jesus leaves and the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And then we see Peter as this amazing orator, this amazing preacher. He wasn't like that before. And so this is what happened. This is the transformation that takes place in a believer's life. But we have to recognize there is this opposition. Look at what it says in verse 15 or 16 and 17. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit... And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other, listen, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Now listen to this. The flesh is going to get you to do things you don't want to do, right? And that's normally the way we read this. But do you recognize the flip side of this? That to do the things of the spirit is not going to be something you want to do. Think about it. He just said, love your neighbor as yourself. Heck no, I can't do that. The Spirit's telling you, you don't want to do the things you were supposed to do. You don't want to do these things. They're constantly in contrast to, to one another. Before Jesus, before the Lord, before your salvation, before every, you would have ran down that, that fleshly road. You would have sought to get even. You would have wanted to pay back. You would have think that, thought it was unfair. And you would have done everything in your power to make the person who opposed you pay. The sad thing is that sometimes as believers we do the same thing. We do the same thing. We want to get even. We don't, it, they're constantly in fighting, fight in battle with one another. And they're, fight, they're, op, they're opposing one another to keep us from doing the things that we're supposed to do, to keep us to do things that we want to do. We don't want to love one another. We want to hate one another. We don't want to be walking according to the flesh, but the flesh is where I want to be. And so we, can't, we live in this battle. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, what in the heck? How do I live this way? How can I live in freedom? How can I, how can I function 
in a way that we're supposed to function, right? It almost sounds contrary, but that's where, Jesus, that's where we go back to this idea of living and understanding the conflict or the, the contrast. He says in verse 18, but, so these are contrary to one another, but if you are led by the Spirit, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. You're not under the law. You're not doing the things of the law. You're not obligated to keep the things of the law. Now you're going to be motivated and moving by the Spirit of God and going in a way that, ple- that God pleases because the Spirit of God is leading you. Let me ask you this. Who's, in, who's leading, you or the Spirit? Where is the Spirit of God in your life? Is he only the guy you tap into when you need help? Is he the only the guy that you, know, you hope gives you some kind of supernatural power? Or is he the guy that's actually leading you? Because here's the way this looks. If the Spirit of God is leading you, guess what you're going to do? The things of the Spirit. Because the Spirit is not going to lead you to do the things of the flesh. So the question is, who's leading your life? Who are you listening to? And who are you following? See, because in order to be led, you have to follow. And that is a challenge, and that is really kind of the answer here. Now, notice what he does. He, now, he, this is where we, we get into the familiar part of Galatians chapter 5. This is the thing that we kind of understand. Now, listen to what he says. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. It's interesting that Paul says, look at that. Now, nobody needs to tell you this. You already know what the works of the flesh are. You know what they are, if you really think about it. But in case you're like, have, you know, amnesia for a moment, Paul says, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorceries, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Okay, there's your list. Anytime the scriptures give you a list, it's not a a suggestion to skip over. It's something to pay attention to. These are the things of the flesh. And you notice, the things of the flesh are not sexually driven all the time. You see, fits of rage, jealousy. We see all these kinds of things that that are going, rivalries, dissensions, divisions. These are all things motivated by the flesh. These are all things that we do without even thinking about them because they're of the flesh. But verse 22 is what we know. Verse 22 is what we know, and you'll notice what it says, the very first word, but. He says, here are the things of the flesh. Here are the things that we're to avoid. These are the things that are in our lives, that creep into our lives, that teach us things and do things. And we, we, this is what we, we know. But, okay, now there's something else. The contrary side to this, he says, and this is what we know. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. One of the things I want you to recognize is that the fruit of the Spirit is not plural. It's not fruits of the Spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit, which means that suggests that when we're walking and we're leading and we're following the Lord, these are the things that are happening in our lives, all of them, all of them. Because the Spirit of God is not going to say, okay, Dave, you need to work on patience, because he knows that. He's not going to do that. He's going to say, Dave, you're not patient because you're not walking with me. You're taking matters in your own hand. You're leading. Stop leading. There are many who say that the list to hear the fruit of the Spirit is really driven by one word, and it's love. Because if you think about it, if you don't have love, you're not going to be joyful, patient, kind, gentle, good, faithful, self-control. You're not going to have any of that, right? And so there is, there is an idea here is that the Spirit of God is driven by love. He's already told us to love one another, same word. But I think Paul is trying to say, okay, now you need to recognize, here's, here's the reality. The reality is you're going to constantly fight. 
There's going to constantly be this battle. But if, you, if, you're, if the Spirit of God leads you, then he's going to lead you away from the things of the flesh and move you towards the things of the Spirit. Because at the end of the day, the, the fruit of the Spirit is what is, what is on display. It's on, it's on show. If, if you're a patient person, or you're a kind person, or all these things are evident in your life, it's not because you decided to choose something really good that particular day. It's because the Spirit of God is working in your life, and you're following him. That's hard to do. That's not easy to do. It sounds preachy, Right, But it's not easy to do when it comes to the end of the day. For instance, some of your, your anger, if, you're, if you struggle with anger like I do, you're going you're gonna to find out that you know, 10 minutes after you pull out of the driveway, somebody's going to cut you off on 94, and who knows what you're going to say? Who knows what's going to go out the window? Right? As much as you come right out of church, you're praising God, you're worshiping God, and you're going to, Lord, I'm going to follow the Spirit, ah, you know, and automatically you're screaming at the windshield because some moron doesn't know how to drive. Did you ever think that you were probably not the one that knew how to drive? Isn't it always somebody else? Right? And so we struggle with this is not easy. This is not easy, but it's possible. Because if it wasn't possible, God wouldn't even tell us here. And God is saying, look, you're not required to do this on your own. I'm going to give you somebody. Jesus says, I got to tell his disciples, I got to leave so that the helper can come and help you. See, the power of the flesh is that we want to be prideful, that we want to be in control, we want to call the shots, we want to be, we want to be the guy that makes the, makes the decisions in life. And that's really what's at the heart of the flesh. And so the heart of the spirit is saying, I'm letting go of that. And I'm getting, the, the spirit is going to follow. I'm going to follow the spirit. I'm going to be led by the spirit. Verse 24, Paul says, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. You see, when you, get, when you become a believer in Jesus through faith, you have a relationship with God. You're crucif you have crucified the flesh because Jesus took that on the cross. It's, it, the, the flesh has to be out of your life, has to be crucified, has to be killed so that you can have the passions of Jesus, so you can have the passions of the Lord. But you have to recognize that there is this opposition that's going to constantly be a part of your life, that is constantly going to be moving in such a way that is going to get you to do things you don't want to do. And when you misstep, it's not a matter of getting discouraged or feeling beaten or feeling destroyed or lost. It's a matter of recognizing it. It's a matter of thanking God for allowing the Spirit of God to show you to walk through life with eyes wide open and, con and confess it. L start now. You know, prayer, sometimes when we pray, this is how we pray. We pray and we jump right to, God, give me this. I got a sore throat. Help my sore throat. Help this person. Help that person. Your prayers with God should always start with, God, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. Because if it doesn't start that way, you might be thinking, well, I'm not a sinner. Start with that. Lead with that. Move in that direction. Because as a believer, you know you're not perfect. We're not perfect. God never said we're perfect. The only way you and I are going to ever be perfect is when we breathe our last and our first breath in heaven. That's when we're perfect. But until then, we're just kind of, we're kind of growing. We're moving. These are the things that kind of challenge us and teach us. Verse 25, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Now, I want you to see a couple different things. How do we live completely under the Spirit's, is that live, we're to live completely under the Spirit's influence, but how? How do we do this? How do we live completely under the Spirit of God? There's a powerful verse that reminds us um, in Ephesians, that Paul reminds us in Ephesians. It's Ephesians chapter 5. I don't know if I have it on the screen here. Oh, there it is. 
He says this, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, this is typically a verse that we use that say, you can't drink wine. Okay, that's usually what we say here. That's not what Paul's saying. Okay, Paul is saying, don't get drunk with wine. Be filled with the Spirit. Think about what happens when you're drunk. You're filled with something that's not the Spirit. And because you're filled and you're drunk with wine, it leads to debauchery. It's always going to lead you down the fleshly lifestyle. I mean, I'm, the, Satan, our Spirit of God is not going to be drinking with you and getting drunk with you. Okay, He's going he's to let you go. He's going to lead you. You're going to walk down that path. And so P- Paul is saying, be filled with the Spirit of God. Just like you, if you drink too much, you're filled with something. He said you need to be filled with the Spirit of God. That's how you're going to be able to walk. That's how you're going to be able to walk properly. We know that when we're filled with alcohol, we can't walk properly. Right? If you get pulled over and you've had a few, the cop's going to have you step out and what he's going to want you to do? Walk. Right? Most of us can do that walk without a problem. Unless there's something in you. Our walk needs to be evident. We need to see it. We need, people need to see it. We need to be moving in such a way. So how do we do this? How do we live completely under the Spirit of God? There are four verbs that come out of this text. Four verbs that drive the action of the text. Okay, And this is what I want you to understand. This is what you need to know and understand as you leave here and as you begin to walk in the freedom that you have, as you relate to one another, as you relate to people who don't know Jesus, how you walk, how you live. There are four things he says. Number one, walk by the Spirit. Walking by the Spirit. This word walk means to walk around. It's how you walk, walking in circles. It's, you know, walking requires one step at a time, right? You know, you're, if you're standing still, you're not walking, but one step at a time. So you're to walk in the Spirit. You're to walk by the Spirit. This is how you're to function. This is everything about your life. Scripture usually refers to this as the conduct and pattern of one's life. Walk by the Spirit. Walk by the things of the Spirit. How can you walk by the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's how you walk. That's how you live. But you can only do that in the Spirit. The second thing that we do is we have to be led by the Spirit. In order to be led by the Spirit, it means you need to be walking behind Him, not in front of Him. Okay? That's what we need to do. That's what the idea of being led by the Spirit. We, we're led by the Spirit. Then we live by the Spirit, he says in verse 25. We need to live by everything that we do, everything how we, how we conduct our lives, how we, how we categorize our lives, what, the, the totality of your life now. You've crucified the flesh, and now you need to live in the Spirit. You live by God, in the Spirit of God, through the blood and, and sacrifice of Jesus. But here's the last picture I think that is really powerful that Paul says here. It's the end of verse, 20, uh, end of verse 25. He says, keep in step with the Spirit. This, use, this word keep in step, this verb here that's usually, that is used here means to walk in rows behind a leader. It instantly, you start thinking military, right? Military, you're walking in rows, right? And you're marching behind a leader, The leader is leading you. You're falling in behind. And usually, when you think of that and you see an army marching or you see soldiers marching, they're they're in step. You ever walked in step with someone? Your steps are theirs. And if somebody was looking at you on the side, they'd only see one person. Paul is saying you need to be in step with the Spirit of God. That means he's walking with you. He's doing the things you're doing. You're doing the things he wants you to do. And you're kept kept in step with the Spirit of God. The only way you can keep in step with the Spirit of God is by beginning in his word, by beginning in prayer, by recognizing your sin, by recognizing where you are at. When 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 you the Spirit of God is pressing upon your heart an area of your life that needs to be changed. 
You need to keep in step. You need to have that picture. You need to be walking in step. You need to be in cadence with the Spirit of God. And the question is, is are you in cadence with the Spirit of God? Or are you out of step? If you're out of step, it's because we have chosen to follow the flesh. The Spirit's not going that way. And so we're going to be out of step. Paul says, keep in step with the Spirit. What a powerful picture to think about. What a, it, you know, as I was thinking about this message, and I thought this is the one thing that popped out of this passage for me, because you know, you've probably read this a million times, and you instantly want to go to the fruit of the Spirit, but it's that keep in step. Right? We're, we're walking, we're living, we're being led by the Spirit, we're in cadence, we're following the leader. We're moving in the same direction. And what a powerful picture that is because we're free in Jesus. Our freedom in Christ is anchored properly when we keep in step with the Spirit of God. Don't abuse your freedom. Don't take it for advantage. Take take it for granted. Walk with the Spirit of God. God, we thank you that you don't require us to do the Christian life on our own. And Lord, too many times we we do it alone, we function alone, and Lord, we get discouraged by it. We, We are challenged by it. Lord, as you walk and as we follow you and as your spirit goes, help us to go where you're going. Even if we don't like where you're going, help us to submit to that. Help us to see your work. Help us to see where you're working. And join you there. Lord, help us to identify those things. Lord, keep the spirit alive in our lives that we received when we trusted in you as Savior. Lord, this is where we live today. This is how we operate and function today. And Lord, your spirit at work in our lives will help us to obey you. Because that's what the spirit of God is going to do. And that's how he's going to lead us. Lord, help us to keep in step with the Spirit. Help us to hear him. Help us to ask for him to lead as we go about our daily lives. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus who died on the cross for our sin to give us the opportunity to have a hope of eternity, but to recognize that our sin enslaves us, keeps us separate from God, from you, Lord. But Jesus died for us so that we could have a relationship with him. And when we trust in you through faith, recognizing our sin, believing that Jesus died on the cross, calling out to you to save us, the spirit of God transforms us instantly. And we begin a new walk. Father, I pray that all of us in this room have done that. Have a relationship with you. Help us, Lord, to keep in step with the spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you for watching today. We believe the Holy Spirit works in everybody's life in very different ways. If you already have a relationship with the Lord, our prayer is that you will grow deeper in your walk with Him. But if you've never trusted in Jesus as your personal Savior, we believe that today could be that day of salvation. Admit to God that you're a sinner, believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, giving you the hope of eternal life and confess Him as Lord of your life, following Him from this day forward. To believe in Jesus requires a very simple prayer of faith, one that you can pray with me right now. Dear Lord, I know that I am a sinner. I ask for your forgiveness. I believe Jesus Christ is your Son. I believe that He died for my sin and that you raised Him to life. I want to trust Jesus as my Savior and follow him as Lord from this day forward. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. We would love to hear about any decision the Lord led you to make, so please take a moment to email us. Again, thank you for watching today, and may God continue to bless your life.